and welcome to Berkshire Guitar Amplifier Repairs. Stuart Smith reporting in from Reading in England. Very quick video today. Actually, it's not even really a repair. I've just had a Marshall JMP01 in, and the customer has a couple of small issues with it, which won't take me long, and he wants me to check the valves inside. So I thought it was just a good opportunity to take the top off this and let you guys and gals have a look inside to see what's inside this beauty. The customer swears by it, absolutely loves it, uses it as a preamp for his uh, main power amp. And uh, so let's have a look inside and uh, you can see what's inside it. The only thing that's really wrong with this is the missing nuts from the input jacks here. They do come loose and fall off and get lost. Shout out to my friend Rob at Pro Audio Service who very kindly sent me a couple of replacement nuts for these. I had real trouble getting these because although you might think this is actually a fairly common insert, if you look at this one here, of which I have plenty, there's quite a fine thread on there, and this is true of all the ones I've been able to get on eBay and whatever for, for amps, and they do not fit here. This has a quite a coarse thread and half a turn on this and it's jammed. So the, the, the nuts on these Marshall GMP1s are a different thread coarseness. And fortunately Rob had a couple, I don't know where he got them from. And you can actually see the difference between the coarseness of the threads there. I haven't tried this yet, but I'm sure this one, these just came in the post this morning. I'm sure this will fit perfectly. Yes, and indeed it does. I've got to put the washer on behind this, so I won't do that now. So that's good. If, you, if you're up in the Leicester area and you have any amp repairs, Rob is definitely your man. What he doesn't know about amplifiers is not worth knowing, so do, do use him. He also does quite a mean range of spare parts, so uh, have a look at his website. So it's an interesting little device, this JMP. Lots of presets here. Gain, bass, middle, treble, presence, etc. Um, overdrive one, clean one, clean two, and it's a digital device, so in that sense it's not kind of really repairable. I've looked inside these before, and uh, yeah, they're full of microprocessors basically, so there's not a lot we can do. But we'll take the lid off, and we will also check the valves, we'll test them on my orange tester, which is over here. I don't expect them to have any problems whatsoever. I'm not going to replace them if they're good. So let's whip the lid off and have a look inside. To do that, you have to take the end cheeks off here with, with some Allen keys. So they come off first, and then all of these black screws come out as some down the side as well, or on the back from memory. Anyway, we'll do it step by step and uh, see what's inside. The human eye really is the most amazing thing. I was able just to look at the hex screw there and go straight to the Allen key set and pick the right one, which fits perfectly. It's amazing what humans can do, really. So we will just loosen these. Like that. And then use the longer end to Take them out. There we go. I won't bore you by taking every single one of these out on video. I'll just do this side. I'm thinking of doing a series called Zen and the Art of Amplifier Maintenance where you see absolutely every detail, you just have this kind of zen type music playing quietly in the background. That should get my viewership up. Right, there we go, so that, that end sheet comes off. And that goes right the way through. This is returned down here, and the chassis is returned up the other way, and that holds, holds them in. So I'll do the other side, then we really can take the top off. 
Well, I like to show you repairs, warts and all, and we have a problem, would you believe, we can't get this end cheek off here because this end Allen key hex screw thing has been stripped by somebody who put it on last time and the Allen key won't grip in it. So I'm going to have to drill that out and uh, then we'll be able to get the, get the end cheek off. This is how it goes, really. So start off with a drill about the same size as the hex insert. Seems quite soft actually, which is good. Then what I normally do is just work up through the drill sizes Eventually the top will just ping off of that hex, leaving a, the stud inside. Yeah, I think that's doing quite well. off more quickly than I would normally expect. That's good, of course that screw can't go back in there now, but it doesn't matter. We, we only need two holding that on perfectly okay. Right, so now, okay, so the lid has come loose now. It's being held on by the stud of this hex screw here. So there are two options here. One is I could try and get a pair of mole grips on there and see if it will unscrew. I'm going to do that anyway, but the other thing is this might just, without me scratching it, it might just lever over there. Oh yes, it has, yep. Yeah. So that's levered over the top of that. Allowing me finally to get the lid off. Now before I do that, let's see if we can get a pair of mole grips on there and remove this. Yeah, it's interesting, I can see that that, that hex screw has been put in slightly at an angle, that's why it's bound. Right, I'm sure you know about good old mole grips, uh, great things. I don't know whether that will close up tightly enough, I suppose it will. Just need to undo that slightly. We want it virtually closed for this. Let's see if that will grip that. Yeah, that's gripped that quite nicely. And with a bit of luck, that will just unscrew leaving us the nice screw hole and we might be able to find a screw that will fit that. Great, look at that. Like extracting teeth, isn't it? Uh, there we go, that's good. So we got that out without too much problem. And now we can at last. Ta -da! Okay, so first thing to notice here is how almost completely unrepairable this device is. In the, if you were foolhardy enough to tackle it, you would have to get this printer circuit board out. All of these are microprocessor chips. What is this? That actually is a microprocessor, an ATC31. I used to use those back in the day. It's, it's a uh, microprocessor chip with its support. In fact, <laughs> this is so old-fashioned nowadays, nowadays. That's the EEPROM, which holds the instruction codes for it. Uh, that's probably a parallel, serial to parallel or something, not quite sure. Not sure what that is. I'd have to look it up. Some sort of support chip. So all this, and there's a crystal which runs the microprocessor. So all this lot here is a microprocessor, which nowadays you would get into a chip exactly like this with all the functionality of that and probably 10 times the memory that that, that, that has got. That's um, 16K, 16K EEPROM chip. I used to use those all the time. 16,000 bytes. These, these days you can get five, yeah, ten, eight meg of, of code in a chip like that for about £3.90. So that shows you how old this technology is. That's the battery backup. 
which will be um, there'll be some some RAM in here, sort of some uh, holding some variables, and that battery backup um, holds that memory whilst the power is down. Here are the valves. I expect them to be perfectly okay, but we will test them. Electroharmonics. Well, that one's an electroharmonics. Oh yes, I think that one is too. Yeah. Um, interesting. The printing is different. Uh, as for the rest of this lot, well. You know, your guess is as good as mine without going down. Op amps, basically. TL74CN, a quad up op amp package. So you've got four op amps, four op amps, four op amps. Probably two, probably two, probably another four. This whole lot here is to do with the power supply. So there's your main transformer. Don't need a lot of current for this. It's not a power amp. And here are your voltage regulators. I haven't even looked at them, but it'll be plus and minus 15 volts, plus and minus 5 volts probably. Here are the smoothing capacitors for for the voltage regulators. And that's it. It's all microprocessor programmable. Forget about repairing it. Chuck it in the bin if it stops working. Job. Unless it's something like a diode gone or a, um, a uh, voltage regulator chip gone. So that's it, really. Thought you'd like a little look inside. Interesting little device. We'll pull these valves now, and we'll put them on the valve tester. I'll fall over if they're not 100%. Preamp valves last quite a long time. You don't really have to change them very often at all. They last decades, in fact. But eventually, like all valves, they do go worn. So let's put them on the, the old orange valve tester here. With this you select the valve you want first of all. This is an ECC83 of course, 12AX7, which is the same thing. thing. We just go along here until this lights up as ECC83. I'll just zoom in a touch on there for you. Like a so. Then you put the valve in. Press this and it starts testing and this goes up and eventually it'll come down to, to here and then to here and to here and to here as it goes through the test procedure and eventually it will give a result and the result will be two of these LEDs will be a light. It will either come up good, worn or fail. I expect it to come up good. Remember there are two valves in a preamp valve, two completely separate amplifying packages in one glass envelope. And so this will measure the gain of the two sides, the two halves of this valve, and give us a gain number at the end. So for example it might say 9 and 10. Or it might just say 9, in which case both of them are 9s, which is great because it, that will be perfectly balanced. If it's 9 and 10 or 8 and 9 or 7 and 6, that's all okay. But if it was 6 and 13 or something, this would be a hugely imbalanced preamp valve and I would reject it. So you can see this coming down quite nicely now, look. Down here now on the 3, now it'll go down to 2. Now it's just about ready to give its final result. Oh, it's failed. Now that is interesting. Very interesting. I've had a little bit of trouble with this orange valve tester, I have to tell you, where it will suddenly start failing preamp valves. You know, just doesn't matter how many you put in, you put ten in a row in and all come up fail. Turn it off for an hour and turn it back on again and they all come up good. So I'm afraid I don't really know what's going on. But why don't we just put that to one side and try again. Now, of course, if this one fails, we'll know there's something strange about the the valve tester. It, it's a little bit Mickey Mouse this orange valve tester but you know it, it, it does the job and for, and for the money it's very good and the, altern the alternative to this is a very fancy huge piece of kit with knobs, dials, bells and whistles uh, which costs a lot of money and you have to know what you're doing to drive it as well. So this is the kind of guitarist's valve tester. Plug, plug, press the button and it comes up with good, worn or fail. And I found it pretty reliable actually for preamp valves. As I say, I'm getting this odd problem where it'll start failing valves. So this is just about coming up to finish now. If this one fails, 
Ah, oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. Hmm. Well, maybe I spoke too soon and we have got a faulty valve. All right, so let me just show you before we go on to that. This is 7 and 8. And so one half of this has got a gain of 7 nominally and the other half's got a gain of 8. That's perfectly okay. So that has come up good. Look on the green. So that is a good valve. I'm happy with that one. I'm going to retest this one now. And if it fails again, first of all, I'll be very surprised. And uh, secondly, I'll have to find, put another valve, a new valve in. Having said, <laughs> speaking too soon and saying, they're bound to be okay. I don't use this for power valves, although it does work. I've got a special homemade tester for my power valves where I can get a lot more accuracy on matching. Because you need to match power valves, you don't need to match preamp valves. Unless it's going into the phase splitter position, in which case it's useful to have both halves. Ah, oh, that's failed again, you see. Look at that. Right, so there's something funny going on here. I don't like the results I'm seeing on this. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, turn the tester off. See this good valve has come up fail now. I'm not sure what's going on here. So I'm going to turn the tester off for a little while, turn it back on again, and then have another go. It's a shame this because I'm losing a little bit of faith in the in the tester now. It's given me these problems. So I'm going to leave the good valve in, good in inverted commas, and then I'll join you in a moment when when we have another go. Okay, uh, the good valve has come up good again, and I'm fairly happy with that, actually, that valve. A, one feature of this tester is, is that a, a genuinely bad valve will never show good, but a genuinely good valve will sometimes come up fail. So the fact that that good valve has come up good twice gives me confidence that it's fine. Here is the failed valve, and let's see what that does. I was uh, talking about Kung Fu, which was a kind of a wandering Shaolin monk TV series. Really used to love that as a kid, and um, it was a it was a shame about uh, David Carradine, the the guy who played the Shaolin master, because he I think he died in some rather strange circumstances. I think he I don't know there was some sort of hint he might have been involved in some some sort of auto asphyxiation or something. Anyway, he was he was found dead in a hotel room of uh, suffocation and he had quite a checkered life so he wasn't really the peaceful loving Shaolin monk we'd all, all come to know and love. Real pity. But that started off that whole Kung Fu phase. That's come up fail again this one. I'm not sure what to do now. So this valve here has failed three times in a row now. I'm just going to get a known good valve. I hope this isn't too tedious for you. I think I'm going to put a caption on this video at the, at the beginning of this sequence telling people to fast forward five minutes if they don't want to watch me testing valves. But it does, this does give you an idea though of how much time is spent on a simple little job like please can you check the valves and and put a couple of nuts on the front, you know. You might think, all oh, right, a fiver or something, but before you know it, you've you've got through an hour drilling out studs, and this has failed three times in a row now. All right, so let's put that to the side, and here's a, a brand new JJ straight out of my box, straight out of my stock. And let's see how that does. I bet this valve is working but for some reason the, the orange tester doesn't like it. And it's getting right to the very end of its test before it fails. Normally if it, if it finds anything wrong at any point in the test it'll come up fail straight away. So I don't know what the test sequence is on this. I don't know how this works, what it does, um, or what the, this final test is that it's failing on. But if this brand new JJ fails, we'll know we've got some sort of issue here. And the customer also said there's no problem with this, with the amp. It's not like one channel's down or anything like that, which it would be if if the valve was faulty. 
Here we go, let's see what the brand new JJ does. Good. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just for your interest, look, uh, quite a big difference in gain between the two halves, seven and a nine. Not dramatic, but, you know, noticeable. Well, you know what I'm going to do now. Go on, put the Zen music on. I have to give this just one more go. So as I was growing up, there were kung fu dojos in almost every town in the United Kingdom. It really, really went wild. You don't think you see it quite so much these days, or maybe I'm just a bit out of touch with it. But um, it was that that uh, kung fu TV series which started all that off. And when I was younger, I used to do a lot of Aikido. I used to do it four times a week at one point, and uh, I really used to enjoy that. It's quite good to do a martial art if you are minded to do it. Right, here we go, this is the faulty one again. No, that's interesting, so I'm going to reject this valve. How interesting. And put this new JJ in. Well, let's do it. I'm very surprised at that, having said to you how long these last. Anyway, we'll put the JJ in there. Electro harmonics in here. Right, so I'm now just going to put this back together and uh, then I'll rejoin you when it's all back together and we can put those nuts on the front. Okay, I've got it all back together now. I didn't have a hex screw 3mm black, so I'm just going to pop in a regular 3mm posi drive and that looks perfect doesn't it so there we go that's all done and the only thing now finally to do uh, oh by the way let me just show you something whilst I've been putting that back together I've been regularly testing the faulty valve and it just comes up fail off time after time after time so that's interesting all we now need to do is to put on these two nuts here which I will do well I do like to show you things warts and all that clanging sound alerted me to the fact that I, I've put those screws back in without putting the end cheek on. It's the sort of thing that happens all the time when you're repairing amps. And I like to keep those things in. It's very easy to run away with the idea that the amp repairer is some sort of super person who hones straight in on faults never misses anything, never makes any kind of mistakes, always puts things back together perfectly the first time. That isn't me. I'm constantly slapping my forehead and saying, uh, duh, what have you done this time? So now that can go back in there like that. Yep, that's okay. Just about long enough. Tighten those up and there we go. Good. So, before I was so brutally interrupted, we're now just going to put in those new nuts. And that's job done on this. And two... Nice. I'm just going to give those a quick half turn. I bought this thing on the internet at somebody's recommendation. They were wincing at me using an adjustable spanner, but I've yet to find anything the damn thing fits. Oh, well, having said that, it does fit that. It's uh, supposed to be a tool for doing exactly this sort of thing, but every pot I've tried it on so far, it hasn't worked. But as it happens, it's worked on that, so there you go. The first use it's got. And there we are, that's the JMP1, I think it was a worthwhile video, we've had a look inside and you've seen the sort of things that can happen just merely taking a lid off and testing a couple of valves. I will have been the best part of 45 minutes on this by the time I finished. Well, an interesting little video in the end I thought, 
I didn't expect much from that. I thought we'd just take the top off, check the valves, they'd be perfectly okay. Stick a couple of nuts on the end, job done. Hardly worth making a video. But it's interesting what emerged from that. I've tested that valve a few more times and it's fail, fail, fail each time. So, don't know. I bet it was working though. I bet it sort of sounded okay. There's something the orange valve tester doesn't like about that valve. So, it was best to reject it. Well, there you go. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you on the next video.